Thanks for joining us today on the Big Blue Podcast. I'm Greg Stone, Metro Campus Provost, here with my co-host, as always, our president, Dr. Lee Goodson. How are you today, Dr. I'm, Goodson? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing really well because we are here to talk about a project I'm really, really excited about. My my metro uh, my metro ness is going to show a little bit, but um, we're here to talk <laughs> about um, an impending, long-awaited. Uh, remodel of the chemistry suite and the biology for non-majors labs at Metro and our guests today are Dr. Connie Bear, who is our Associate Dean for Science and Math and Sean Wines our Vice President for Administration and our Chief Operating Officer both of whom are really uh, integral parts of this process so thanks to both of you for being here today and finally Connie after finally. all this time right um, why don't we start off give us an overview about what those lab areas look like now and what have been the challenges for those labs and I'll I'll maybe just before I let you go with that answer just mention that when I was a student here myself now a quarter of a century ago as of this year that's exactly how those labs looked I mean they really look basically exactly the same as they did 25 years ago and they were a little outdated even back in 1993, right? So yes, talk these, us through what it's like. These labs were created in 1973. And essentially, the only thing that's been done is um, minor equipment repairs or updates as we've gone along. Um, it's the biology lab, room 615, which it houses non-majors biology and zoology, and then the chemistry suite, which is 603 and 644, and we have five different chemistry courses that go through there. I did an estimate um, and came out with about 17,000 students have gone through lab 615, and more than 27,000 have taken a class in one of those chemistry labs since 1973. Wow. So what do they look like? Um, they look old and outdated. <laughs> they were set up the way labs were set up 30 years ago with big, long, heavy black tables mm -hmm. as the student workstations. Um, there's too many cabinets with drawers that don't close well now after all these years and things like that and a lack of appropriate space for storeroom supplies and for preparatory areas. Um, the challenges for the staff include the lack of good space to prepare things for the labs, keeping up with aging equipment, and then also the constraints of the facility. Mm -hmm. Um, in part because <clears throat> teaching chemistry has changed. Well, in the that's last 30 exactly years, right? right. For yeah. faculty, that challenge is to effectively teach in a space that doesn't really support collaborative learning or student engagement. The old way to teach was to stand in front of the class and tell the students what to do, but things have changed a lot. The big tables were fine for that, mm -hmm. but now we know that students benefit by spaces where they can. Uh, collaborate, that promote interactions, and working together on projects. Um, also, the current setup sort of forces the faculty to have to go around all these obstacles in order to work with each of the students. And then we have some students who have some difficulties moving around in those labs. Yeah. That's amazing that we've had those labs here in service for that long. And, and kudos to <clears throat> to Connie and her predecessors, and certainly the faculty members for all those years of, of making it work. But yeah, it's it's time for a for mm -hmm. a good refresh and advocating for a renovation. Yeah. Sean, we're always talking about money at the at the E team level and the budget and how to how to um, put priorities in place that help student success. And this project was mentioned to me, I know, back in 2014, right when I started. Mm -hmm. Someone may have asked me about it in my interview. I'm not <laughs> sure. I think it was such a pressing issue at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, t talk to us a little bit about how the dollars became available for this and, um, and a little bit about maybe uh, some of the other projects that are in the foundation campaign. You bet. Yeah, and, and what an exciting project. And you're right, I remember when you first started, Dr. Goodson, this, this was one of those kind of obvious funding opportunities that had such 
um, immediate and direct opportunity, immediate opportunity and direct impact for students to, to help make students more successful. Um, so so we we attempted for the past several years uh, with Dr. Abear and faculty, Dr. Stone, yourself as advocates for this. Uh, we, we tried every, exhausted every avenue possible uh, in a very unpredictable fiscal environment to find a funding source for this. And I, I, I think it really wasn't until the uh, campaign for completion that we had a direct, um, a bona fide opportunity to fund this with a sense of confidence that it would, it would follow through. Mm -hmm. And so the campaign for completion uh, is uh, a, a current capital campaign that Tulsa Community College's foundation um, is conducting, facilitating, uh, with some remarkable leadership. Uh, the campaign is chaired by Stacy Schusterman, and we have community leaders, um, uh, it, uh, you know, from around Tulsa who are helping with this endeavor. Um, that campaign right now has a goal of 2.5 million dollars um, that would specifically go towards this facility and support services, maintenance, etc. Um, and so, uh, early on, I think this was. Um, identified as a priority within the campaign. So within a $20 million campaign, this became an obvious um, need and priority in the short term. Um, interesting note, I was a student here as well about 25 years ago-ish, so Dr. Stone and I may have walked the same That's hallways. Um, and I, I, I remember then, I, I was scared of chemistry, so I didn't take chemistry classes, but I remember then walking by and peering through the window and thinking, Ah, uh, we, we, you know, probably need an update, you know, at some point in time. <laughs> and, and again, kudos to the faculty uh, in that area because they've they've done a lot with that um, over the years. Um, Dr. Goodson, to your point, I think the, the opportunity for us is how do we how do we become entrepreneurial as a state agency in the midst of uncertain, unpredictable, mm -hmm. uh, you know, revenue um, uh, projections from the state and other sources as well. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so thank goodness for uh, the TC Foundation because they're they're what made this happen. And and really, if not for the advocacy from you, Dr. Goodson, from from Connie, from Greg, keeping this as a priority throughout the years. Absolutely. And I just I have to say, the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation made the lead gift for the campaign. And I, in talking to their principal, Stacy Schusterman, she said, "What, what is the most pressing issue after?" advisors because her first priority in this campaign is advisors and of course that's seven million of the twenty million dollar campaign I said man those labs are really no longer impacting our students the way they need to and we it's just something that needs to be done immediately so if you're interested in any building projects that's the one and she, you know when she came back and their board came back with the decision it was it was to fund those labs. So we're grateful for that mm -hmm. lead gift as well, and we think that um, the rest will come very soon, so we're going to go ahead and proceed. Yeah. Sean, just really quickly, who's involved in the project? <clears throat> Maybe you just want to mention the architects and who sort of is involved in leading the project, and what's our basic overall timeline at this point? Yeah, great question. So we, we've got uh, KKT is the architect uh, that we've hired, the, the architectural firm we've hired to facilitate this process. Uh, we have an internal, really kind of a cross-functional, collaborative team committee that's um, helping to chair or lead this process, and that, of course, includes um, Dr. Connie Abear, um, faculty from both chemistry and biology areas. We have our facilities team that's involved with that, and so we will meet uh, regularly until the completion the, the completion of this project. And of so, course, safety and compliance and, is a and, big part. And safety and com compliance. We have Matt Sharp, who's attending uh, meetings and going through from start to finish because it, it this is more than than just a classroom remodel. There's very, very unique technical nuances to this project that, that make it special. And um, chemicals that may explode if they're not <laughs> handled properly, right? Right. And chemicals There's that always that. Properly. That's right. No, no, we have complete control over all that. Yes, it's we fine. do. Actually, we do. It's in good shape. No, <laughs> sa safety is uniquely important on this project for sure. Um, we're, we're estimating early 2019. In a perfect world, we, we would love to be done by December of this year. I think that's ambitious to think at this point we'd be done by December. Um, however, uh, KKT, they've heard us loud and clear. They have mechanical engineers. They have uh, teams that are looking at the, you know, it, it's one thing when you start a remodel or a project like this at face value. It, it, you know, when you start the project and you have a kickoff meeting, it's another thing when you start uh, demolishing and looking behind walls that were built a long, long time ago. So you don't know what you don't know, but early 2019 is when we're anticipating completion. So would that mean classes for spring of 19 or probably not scheduling those yes or no 
probably those will be scheduled on other campuses as they're being done now. I see. I understand. Okay. I'm Lee Goodson here with my co-host, Dr. Greg Stone, and you're listening to the Big Blue Podcast. Our guests today are Sean Wines, our Vice President for Administration and Chief Operating Officer, and Dr. Connie Bear, our Associate Dean of Math and Science. We've been talking about the renovation of some chemistry and biology labs at Metro Campus. Long awaited. Connie, how many students typically work in those labs in each semester? So what's the, what's the direct impact each semester that will encounter once these are completed? Well, I went back and looked, and over the last three years, we've had an average of about 100 students taking biology 1114 or 1604 in, in, in that lab, and uh, which is over a long semester, so either spring or fall. We average less in the summer and usually only offer one or two classes in lab 615. For chemistry, we have five different courses. We have about 250 students in fall about 215 in spring and roughly 50 in the summer. Um, in order to accommodate the remodel, we're relocating these classes. We are not canceling them. They've been relocated to other campuses mm -hmm. for the duration of the remodel. Northeast and west. Actually, and some yeah. at southeast. Some at southeast. Um, southeast is the only other campus with a facility for organic chemistry. So we've had to do some shuffling to make sure we don't have to cut back on those classes. Just in the last couple of minutes we have then, <clears throat> just I'll ask each of you, Connie, maybe we can start with you. What does is, what is a successful project look like to you at the end? What are you, what are you hoping to see when all is said and done? For me, it means the labs will not just be up to date, but will really be ready for the future. Um, science teaching has changed like everything else with a lot of emerging technologies and evolving pedagogies and all of that. And we want to keep the lab experience relevant and prepare our students for the future, re whether it's a transfer to a four-year or to enter the workforce. Um, so that and then also I want the labs to inspire those students. And that's what I feel like we lack, especially the non-major students. I, I really would like to convert people to mm -hmm. science. That's great. And so um, I, I want them to be able to see what's really amazing about chemistry and biology and to, uh, to incite some enthusiasm. Um, for example, one of the things we will be doing is having, since we're doing some undergraduate research now, is setting up an area for research in both of those areas so that students can see what other students are doing and what the opportunities and possibilities are. That's great. Sean, do you have anything to add to that? Well, just I think uh, Connie just took the words out of my mouth. I'm, I'm hoping that this is an inspiration for students, students who perhaps were like me, maybe uh, don't see themselves in a career trajectory and in a, in a STEM field, who maybe this is what converts them. Maybe this is what inspires them to consider a career in, in science, technology, engineering, math, et cetera. Um, we have amazing faculty in these areas, and just in the initial kickoff meetings have had some um, tru truly um, inspirational ideas about what this facility could look like um, in terms of engagement opportunities for students. And so um, I, I think in a year, a year from now, you're going to see not just a new functional lab area. We know that'll happen. Um, but you're going to see something special that TCC can be very proud of for, for our students. That's wonderful. I can't wait to see it Me when too. it's ready to go. Yeah. All right. At the end of each podcast, we ask the big question, and it is, if you could go back and give advice to your 18-year-old self, what would it be? Who do you want to go first? I think you, Dr. Okay. Um I would say take your time and follow your heart. Don't rush through your education and try to get everything done in a, sem in a semester for what you hope will be the rest of your life. Take your time um, and, and remember that education is really a journey and not a destination. Mm -hmm. Just one thing, just one thing to tell my 18 year old self? One. You're limited <laughs> to one, Sean. Cause, cause, I know you're enthusiastic. Because there's so many opportunities. No, I, you know, I think um, to tell my 18 year old self one thing uh, would be just to remember that every single thing matters, every detail matters. So um, giving a hundred percent both personally and professionally to life, uh, it matters at 18, that's when it starts, and it matters at 40, it matters at 60, um, but giving a hundred percent to every detail of life. Love it. 
Well, you've been listening to the Big Blue Podcast. We want to thank our guests, Sean Wines and Dr. Connie Abear, <clears throat> excuse me, for spending some time with us today. And we want to thank you for listening. Remember that you can listen to the Big Blue Podcast each week in the week at Tulsa CC and on the Creativity Channel on YouTube. And we will see you next time. See you next time.